Hi everyone, my name is Jack. I'm going to share with you uh, one topic today. It's about the role of this antioxidants in the skin, their healthy aging effects. I'm an assistant professor from UCSI University, Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. So um, you might be wondering why me as a biochemist is sharing this topic to you, because this topic itself actually is very relevant to one of the programs that I'm teaching here in UCSI University, which is the Master of Science in Healthy Aging, Aesthetic and Regen Medicines. So uh, first of all, let me just do uh, uh, declarations. These topics was taken or this lecture was taken from a review talk paper written by a a Japanese researcher. His name is Hitoshi Masaki. He himself is a, a professor from a pharmaceutical university in Kyoto. He has been years of experience in uh, formulating cosmetic sciences, cosmetic products, and he also he dedicated most of his research in uh, skin sciences and also skin uh, physiologies. Okay. He has been in this cosmetic industry for more than 25 years. So the reason why I'm picking uh, his paper to share with you all is because his paper is more um, uh, general, more layman, I would say. It's not that in-depth and it doesn't involve so many molecular names. Because I know well uh, from my past experience that I have with my students is doctors tend to mix up all the molecular names. So we're going to go be very brief today, but we're going to look at it at a very more uh, critical aspect. Instead of going into a uh, biochemistry aspect, we'll be looking more into the critical side for today's lectures. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about the introduction to reactive oxygen species, the effects of antioxidants, and how does it help to counter off the effect of uh, RS or what we call as reactive oxygen species? Okay. Okay. First of all, RS or reactive oxygen species can be divided in generally into two types. The first type would be the um, radicals or what we call as the oxygen species with an unpaired electrons. So what does it mean? It means that this molecule, first of all, the core, since we're calling it RS, the core must be the oxygen molecule that form the core of the molecules, okay? So this kind of molecules, they have a, uh, unpaired electrons, means that they are more um, highly prone to oxidize other molecules, causing oxidations of other molecules. Okay, so they are highly reactive. Okay, so the first type is the oxygen species with uh, um, unpaired electrons. Okay, so it can be in the anion stages or it can be in radical stages. So just for your information, um, radical is much more reactive as compared to the and ion uh, stages, okay? Why is that so? Radical is highly unstable because the pair electron is not there. And ion, although there's unpaired, but the charge is not as high as radicals. So uh, technically both can cause oxidations, but radical is at the higher stage or higher uh, capability of, of oxidizing other molecules. So there are four, generally there are four types under the um, unpaired electron types. First one is superoxide anions, radicals, okay. Uh, you also have hydroxyl radicals, lipid peroxide radicals, and nitric oxide radicals. So all these, you'll be hearing it quite often later on in my lectures, okay. Second type of the um, oxygen, we call it as oxygen molecule that are in excite stage, okay. This are mainly uh, composed and composed of single oxygens. Okay. So and also there's another very important one because the hydrogen peroxide, which is the intermediate product that's produced 
from the declarations of the uh, initial radical stage. So generation of RS, how does this, all these radicals or what I call so-called RS comes into our skin on the first stage, our first place? There are two possible ways, okay? Let's talk about endogenous way first. So endogenous, doesn't matter you are in the cell, uh, in the body, okay? Liver cells, lipocyte, okay? Uh, hepatocyte, etc. Or in your skin cell, creatinocytes, etc. They are both mainly generated by your respiratory uh, change, okay? Or your respiration process. If you can still recall your biochemistry in your first year or year two in your medical school, when you come to the last stage of respirations, there'll be a stage where the oxygen is being passed by the electron transport change and being fully reduced to H2O. And actually, in fact, that ETC, the electron transport chain, is the main factory of generating RS in your body. Why is that so? Because this ETC process is actually a high error prone process. Okay? You need to receive a four electron in order to go through a complete reduction by the end of the ETC process. However, this process is more, most of the time, I would say, is incomplete. That means this oxygen might receive one electron, two electron, or even three electron, but it's not four electrons. So when you're not receiving the full complete four electrons, the oxygen itself will become reactive. Okay? So of course, the one with one, only one electron will be the most reactive one uh, compared to those that are receiving two and those that are receiving three. So in fact, this oxygen species that doesn't complete the whole electron transport change are the one that contributing to your endogenous RS uh, accumulations. So if you come to our class, this is actually part of the theory of aging. You have so many philosophy about how we age and what are the reasons that are causing the aging. And this reactive Oh, sorry, the oxidative stress is the one of the schools that is being fam very famous and being accepted by a wide range of researchers. That oxidative stress is the accumulative damage in a body that you only see the effect at the later stage of your life. Okay, so one in, in this school of thought, actually. The researcher believe that mitochondria is act as a biological clock of the human life. When your mitochondria is working too fast, that means that your mitochondria are generating too much of RS, and that means that your oxidative stress is higher as compared to other people. So do join us. If you join our program, then you find out more about uh, this school of concept. But today we're going to stop here for endogenous RS. I think that's good enough for you to understand where do you generate all the endogenous RS from the body. So when you go for exogenous, when you talk about the external factors, then mainly you got the RS from the sunlight exposure. So as you all know, you have UVA, UVB, and in fact you have UVC as well. But for skin damage, we're going to talk, uh, focus more on UVA and UVB today. So UVA produces RS through the photosensitizing uh, reactions with internal chromophores such as uh, riboflavin and porphyrins. So chromophores means the pigments, the color pigment in the blood, also oh, in the skin. So color pigments, that means you have the brown color, you have the red color, etc. Okay. So generally, the sunlight, when you expose to UVA, it actually generates the RX by default. And is via the internal chromophore or these color pigmentations. Okay. So UVA also generates, so mainly if you go, if you generate via the chromophore, you'll get the single oxygen which is the main type. And you also will be getting superoxide and radicals. 
the other types. Okay, we're going to talk about their raw items, but all this is definitely causing damage to your skins. Okay, and um, beside that, UVA also generate uh, superoxide radicals via the activation of NADPH oxidase activations. Okay, or the photosynthesizations uh, uh, of advanced glycation products. So we, by the end of this lecture, I'm going to put the link of this review, full review articles, okay, below the post. So you guys wanted to know more of how the whole process of the our generation caused by the UVA, you may refer to this full review articles. But for today's lecture, due to the time limits, I won't be going into very details of the review content itself, okay? So for UVB, UVB mainly stimulates the production RS via the activation and activation of oxidase and also respiratory, respiratory chain reactions, which is the mitochondria that I mentioned earlier. So but it means that beside your metabolism that is being running in your body itself, UVB also can accelerate the metabolisms in the skin cells. So mainly you'll be getting superosa and radicals from these rep uh, respiratory change reactions. So um, from this diagram here, you'll see how the whole things, uh, how the RS is interact with our skins and how it causes damage and how does our body actually counter off the effects from the reactive uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. So let's go back a little bit earlier on what we've been talking just now in the previous slide. As you can see here, UV, okay, via the NADPH oxidase, okay, or mitochondria, it actually generate the superoxide radicals, okay. Like I told you earlier, radical is very high in reactivity, which means it's it, it, it can't be stabilized, you know. It is readily oxidizing the others in order to stabilize themselves. By standing alone, it is highly unstable. So why it is causing a lot of damage? Because it actually it actually starts to oxidize either molecules that it in its surroundings. That's why it is highly dangerous to the skin cells. Okay. So as you can see here, um, the oxidase and then the oxidase and mitochondria actually generating the superoxide radicals. And via the chromophore here, you also will be generating the single oxygen. And single oxygen will release electron to the surrounding and producing the superoxide radicals. Now, this is particularly important because superoxide radical technically is the source of the um, superoxide radical and hydroxy radical is actually the start, the sources of damage to all the cells. Okay, you might see a lot of different types like what you've been seeing here. Okay, all these, there are different types of radicals. Okay. But this all radical actually came from the early stage of singlet and superoxide radicals. Okay, now when you have radical in your bodies, always remember their target is three types. Whether they are lipids or they might be targeting the proteins. And if they manage to break through the lipids, if they manage to mutate the proteins or break down the proteins, then they will be get their hands on the DNA itself. So DNA technically is the one that's most protected, is embedded within the nucleus, and nucleus is, is being covered by the membranes, and outside you have another membrane. So technically it's quite safe. But if when your RLS is accumulating to a very high level, then this damage might be able to break through all the barrier break through your lipids, break through your proteins, and eventually reach, to your, uh, reach your DNA and causing the damage to your DNA. So why is that important? Because if you 
if you can still recall your molecular sciences, when the damage is coming to your DNA, it will cause mutations. And when our body trying to uh, recover or repair the DNA, it actually will trigger more mutations and eventually it might cause cancer, the unstoppable or uh, un, uh, uncontrolled mutation, uh, uncontrolled uh, deprecation of the cells, what we call as a cancer. So, of course, we, our system will try to stop all this uh, before it can actually reach the DNA itself. So, basically, first thing that they oxidize, it will be the lipids. Why? Because lipid is the first thing they encounter. Okay? Uh, whether you are generating from uh, mitochondria or you are generating from the skin cell externally, the lipid is always the first thing they are going to encounter. So lipids, what, when the radicals, okay, oxidizing the lipids on the membranes, we call this process as the lipid procedations. Okay. So lipid procedations will generate some side products, okay, like the uh, hydroperoxides, okay, etc. That will then leads to the damage to the proteins. Okay, here. Okay, forming the protein carbonylations. Okay. Now we're done with this. Okay, this part here. So singlets uh, will cause damage. Singlet oxygen will cause damage to the lipid. Okay, this process we call it lipid procedures. And by the end of the process, you're getting a different kind of hydroxyproxide. Uh, species and these species may cause damage to the protein itself. Okay, so um, it might be producing lipid peroxide, it also may be producing the aldehydes. And when you react with the proteins, it may produce uh, carbonyl proteins. And this process we call it as a protein carbonylation. Now, superoxide radicals will normally be converted into H2O2. Okay, so this is a very crucial process. Okay, naturally, we have two ways to convert the superoxide radical into H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide. Okay, first way is the decomposition that happen naturally but in a very slow pace, okay? That means it happens in your body, but in a very slow rate. You might take very a day or few days in order to decompose it, a very small amount of them. A second way is via the enzymatic activity, okay? And this enzyme is known as suprocyte dismutase, okay? So this suprocyte new, new uh, this mutase we call it as the first line of defensing system in the, our body. Why is that so? Because if you notice here, the antioxidant doesn't come into a picture until S or D react on the radicals. Okay? And only you find catalase, glutathione proxidase, glutathione, okay? all this antioxidant come in the picture. Okay, so when later on we will go, uh, go further down on my lectures, you will hear a lot about this SOD and how important is this SOD. Okay, so remember, SOD is important to convert superoxide radical into hydrogen peroxide. Only then, the other enzymatics antioxidants such as catalase, glutathione proxidase, ascorbic proxidase, glutathione, ascorbic, all these things can react on the hydrogen peroxide. Without SOD, none of them can do anything on reducing the radicals except the glutathione ascorbic. Okay, so enzymatic activity basically they all need SOD. Okay, without SOD, without the conversion of uh, radicals to H2O2, 
you will not be able to further degrade the radicals in the skin cells. Okay, so uh, H2O2 will then further breakdowns okay, by catalase or protodiversidase into H2O or oxygen. Okay, then this is the harmless molecule to the body. Okay, SOD is important to stabilize the radicals here, the supracellular radical. It convert it to another type of RS, the H2O2 also another type of RS, but in a more stable form and a more convertible form to be further degraded. Okay. Of course, H2O2 can also be converted back to other type of uh, radicals, provided you have a copper in the copper ion is in the in the bodies or the ferrums, high ions, okay, anions in the bodies that trigger that. Okay, and this is what you call as a phantom reactions. Okay, the conversion of H2O2 to hydroxyl radicals. Okay, it's called the phantom reaction. This one. Okay. So bear in mind that if you don't get to degrade the H2O2 in time, the H2O2 might have the chances to be converted back to radical later on in the later stage. So in a way, it means that yes, SOD is important. It is important to convert to radical in the H2O2, but yet you need also, catalase, mutatal presidase, all this enzyme to, to get to fall out and then brings down the radical levels in the skin cells. Okay, so technically, this is the general picture on how RS initiate the oxidative chain reactions in the skin cell or even in the bodies. Doesn't really matter, this is quite a general picture. And how our body counter off the effects or try to minimize damage that can be potentially done by the RS by interfering it with our antioxidant system. Okay, it's either by enzymatic antioxidants or in via the, the antioxidant molecules. Okay, non-enzymatic type. Okay. Now, now we know how the RS can be generated in our body. And then next, we're going to talk about how the effects, how the RS can damage the skin cells. Okay. So um, generally, there are four main damage that the oxidative stress can be done, uh, the effect that can be done on the skin. The first one is inflammation. Okay. So UVB, okay, the, the UV uh, ultraviolet B radiations actually induce erythema in our skin okay, via the increased production of nitric oxides. So uh, how it actually uh, increases production of NO is via the activation of prostaglandin Grinding E2 synthesis. So prostaglandin E2 synthesis is the um, is the synthesis that produce prostaglandins, and during the production of this prostaglandin, it actually involves an enzyme called COX2, and this COX2 actually will stimulate the inflammation process. Okay, which it, in other words, that UV, UVB Okay, increase nitric oxide, nitric oxide increase the prostaglandin synthesis and prostaglandin synthesis indirectly actually accelerate the inflammation process. Okay. And of course, when you call when you're calling this oxidative stress, definitely cause oxidative damage. So we are expecting the radical on the cell will actually oxidize the lipids and oxidize the proteins okay, in the cells that actually alter the skin conditions. So when that's happened, um, it, it actually disrupts the skin barrier function. As you all know, skin barrier function, skin barrier actually built out by a, a composition of lipids and also proteins in order to protect our cells, the remain the moisture of our skins, 
to, to keep our skin healthy. So oxidizing of these lipids and proteins, uh, for sure it will alter the barrier functions. And when the barrier function is being altered, the protective uh, effects of the barrier uh, towards the UV damage will also be decreased. So it's like a chain reaction, you know. UV causing the, the destruction of the barrier function. Barrier function will then uh, increase the vulnerabilities towards the UV damage and vice versa and the loops keep going on. So when this uh, oxidation is keep on happening on the skin, it actually increases the production of SCCP, or what we call as the stratum corneal carbonylate proteins, as you heard earlier. Okay, stratum corneal means the level of the utmost layer of the skin. Carbonylated proteins mean proteins that is being damaged by the radical or the uh, end products or the sub products of proteins damaged by oxidative stress. And this, this is highly associated. The level of SCCP has been shown in the previous study that this is highly associated with atopic dermatitis. Okay, and the, atopic dermatitis is a kind of allergies due to the uh, reduce of the effectiveness of the skin barrier functions. So, um, in fact, in the previous study, the, it, the finding also showed that SCCP can be used as an indicator of oxidative stress that we are having in our skins. Okay. So, uh, the bracket you will be seeing here in the slide 5, 6, actually it refers to a references um, you might see in my last slide. So if you guys is interested later on, you may refer to the last slide and then, if, then you may look for the journals with more details on all these statements here that I'm citing it in my slide. Okay, so let us just move on. Okay, so besides inflammation, it also causing the alteration in the uh, speckers grand functions. Okay, so UV radiation, I think all you, all of you know, when you expose the sunlight for too long, you will secrete more sebum in the skin. So um, this is actually a mechanism that is induced by the by the oxidative stress. Okay, so this is this stress to alter the functions of the sebaceous um, grains, and it trigger the sebum secretions. Why is that so? This sebum actually is the end pro or side products of the damage that the UV done on the lipids on the skin. So um, this product included the oxidized lipids, okay, triacyl, glycerolite, hyperprocise, or even cholesterol, hydroprocise. And um, this is even worse, okay, if you happen to be at the stage of um, teenagers, okay, that is very prone to acne. Why is that so? They are the, the, the mechanisms of acne, okay, it is usually triggered by the blockage or the clot in your pores, skin pore, okay, when you have too much of that cell that clot inside, and when you have too much of sebum, then this will cause the, uh, the cultures or the growth of the bacteria uh, pre acne. So when that happens, when you have a lot of sebum uh, productions, it actually increases the chances of you having acne. Then the worst thing is that RS also trigger the production of singlets. So these singlets will, will also contribute to the inflammation process, which later on will give the more long-term effects on your skin by producing uh, inflammatory uh, acne lesions on your skin. So, recaps, okay, it can increase the sebum productions and it makes the skin more prone to acne. Then later on, when the acne comes to the later stages, 
the oxidative stress also contribute to the inflammatory reactions uh, of the acne. Okay. The third thing is pigmentations. So RLS has been um, known to have a paradoxical ac action on the skin. So what does it mean? Um, I, I'm sure you guys heard of uh, vitiligos before. Okay. So vitiligo is a deep pigmentation in the macule in the cells due to the, um, the loss of pigments, uh, color pigments. So why is that so? ROS, as I mentioned earlier, it comes in a radical form and let on being converted into HRD, HR hydrogen peroxides. And VTD goes happens when you have too much of H2O2 accumulating in the uh, melanocyte cell, okay, in, into the melanocyte, causing the degeneration of melanocytes. So why is that? So it means that in this kind of people, okay, with illegals, in their skin cell, they have high level SOTD, okay? That means they're converting a uh, superoxide radical into H2O2 very frequently. But unfortunately, they doesn't have enough ascorbic acid or um, vitamin E or glutathione or ascorbate proceeds or other proceeds that can reduce the H2O2 into H2O2 into uh, H2O or oxygen. So this will cause an uh, improper or imbalance system in the melanocytes, causing the depigmentations of the skin. Okay. Now, when you talk about the melasma, or the dark pigmentations, it also can cause pigmentation. Okay, that is a very interesting part of the RS damage. Okay, just now we talk about uh, H2O2 uh, accumulations when it's high, it's really uh, causing the degradation degradations of the melanocyte. But at the same time, RS can actually contribute to the melanogenesis, and this has been started being demonstrated in a lot of studies here. You can refer to the citation here, okay, 9 and 10, okay. So how does it trigger the melanogenesis? melanogenesis? It, ROS actually trigger the epidermal phenylalanine hydroxylase or PAH, okay, which is an enzyme that producing the tyrosine and tyrosine is the metabolite you need in order to form the dark pigments. So that is how it is, okay? Uh, first, if you have too much H2O2, then when your system is good in SOD, then it causes depigmentation, okay? But when you doesn't have good enough system of SOD, the radical is high, then it triggers the um, PAH, and later on, it forms the tyroxines, and tyroxine build out the dark pigment on the skin. So technically, it all quite depends on how good is your antioxidant system in the body. Okay. And lastly, is the dermal matrix. So when you come to dermal matrix, we are talking about the collagen synthesis. We all know that wrinkles is formed by, uh, is due to the loss of the collagen underneath the skin. So in fact, the study has been shown, a lot of study has been shown that the UV damage is able to decrease the corrigence synthesis okay, or disrupt the corrigence synthesis. Okay. So how does it, how, how the whole thing goes? Um, first, the single oxygen generated by your UVA radiation can actually stimulate the expression of a uh, enzyme called matrix metalloproteinase. Okay, so this enzyme actually is an enzyme that uh, breaks down collagen, the 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 collagen, uh, the overall collagen underneath the skin. So in our body, we constant uh, constantly have the synthesis of collagen, 
and you also have constantly breaking down of the corrigence. So it's like a system that keeps in the balance. But with the RLS that mesh, it actually speed out the breaking down process, okay? By stimulating the expression of metric metal operativeness uh, in the thermal fiberglass, okay? And studies also show that UV exposure can slow down the synthesis of new carriages corrigence and even lower the productions or even cease the production at all. So means that RS not just accelerating the breaking down of the corrigence, but it also slow down the production of the corrigence. So with the combination of this, it actually accelerating the aging of the skin. Next, we're going to talk about the effects of antioxidant on the skin and the skin cells. So ascorbic acids, okay, it can be in many names. It can be in ascorbic acids. It can be uh, called ascorbic, or we call it vitamin C. Doesn't matter, you all refer to the same things. The main sources of ascorbic acid, I'm afraid you all would know, um, this come from citrus food. It can be from the lemons, from orange, etc. Okay, so ascorbic acids, it's a very powerful antioxidant because it has the high content of hydrogen inside. So if you come across any um, active molecules with the high content of hydrogen, means that this molecule most likely processing a uh, antioxidant capabilities. So as, why ascorbic acid is very powerful? Mainly because it itself can actually neutralize the radicals or the single oxygen without the help from any enzyme. The first thing, okay, due to the readily available hydrogen inside the ascorbic acid. But at the same time, this ascorbic acid can also be used as the core factors for enzymatic activity in order to break down the H2O2. So, for example, um, just now you see when the H2O2 is producing a lot in the body, it has to be further degraded into H2O. And that relies a lot on the proxidase enzyme. Okay? So this uh, proreohydrosylase, ascorbic proxidase are the two main enzymes that actually importance in breaking down the hydrogen peroxide or our H2O2. That really makes the ascorbic acid a very powerful antioxidant. Okay, let me recap again. Ascorbic acid not just be able to neutralize the radicals, whatever you see, superoxide radicals or single oxygen by itself, but it also can be used as a core factors by the enzyme, enzymatics antioxidant to break down the H2O2. So technically with the ascorbic acid, you can break down the, the radicals all the way from the top to bottom with enough ascorbic acid in your body. Okay? So um, study has been shown that ascorbic acid is powerful in depigmenting or uh, in the depigmentations because it uh, has a very uh, inhibitory effects on the tyrosinase. So tyrosinase is also one of the enzymes involved in the uh, productions of melanin, the dark pigmentation in the skin. And recent studies also show that ascorbic acid can enhance the, um, the epidermal differentiations. So it also can increase Besides epidermal differentiations, it also can stimulate the blood flow. What does it mean? With that means, it actually can uh, speed up a bit on the skin cell cycles when you have more, uh, have the new skin cell being recycled more frequently as compared to the normal process. Okay, now, do you you might think that ascorbic acid is so powerful, then why don't you just all apply vitamin C every day, right? But unfortunately, 
the efficacy of topical applications of ascorbic acid is relatively low as compared to other antioxidants. First, it's due to the poor skin penetration. Secondly, it's because of the powerful antioxidant properties. So, if it doesn't uh, encapsulate the ascorbic acids, okay, when it's exposed to the air, the moment when you apply your cream on the hands, it has been oxidized by the oxygen they have in the air. Which that means that when the moment we exposed to the air, we might already lost up to 70% of these activities. Okay, you might, and with the low penetrations, the skin, by the end of the day, might be only getting maybe a few percent, three, five percent of the ascorbic acid they apply on the skin. So this is always a, a, a problem they are facing nowadays, especially in the cosmetic field or aesthetic fields that we still couldn't manage to formulate a perfect formula in order for the ascorbic acid to penetrate deep enough into the skin and to prevent the oxidations with the prevent the oxidations reaction with the air, with the ambient air. Okay. So the next we're going to talk about is vitamin C E, okay, or what we call as tocopherols. Tocopherols can be um, gotten from natural source. Okay, um, as well like vitamin E, uh, vitamin C. So vitamin E, tocopherols, mainly you can get them from seeds, uh, or nuts. Okay, uh, like flaxseed, flaxseed oils, almonds, etc. Okay, mainly they came from all these sources. But we won't be able to get a lot of high dosage, but sufficient enough, uh, sufficient amount that you can get daily is uh, you can get from the fruit. Okay. So um, it's comprised of a chromano rings that I'm showing you here and the hydrophobic side. So technically this one is doesn't, it's not acid, but it do have a lot of hydrogens that hanging around, they're branching out here. So this hydrogen also the one that helps to, to do its works in reducing the, um, the oxidative stress in the body. So now, um, vitamin E technically can only directly neutralize, okay? It can only directly neutralize the radicals, okay? It cannot be, it, it, it was, cannot be used in the enzymatic activity in reducing, but it itself can directly neutralize the radicals. So study did show that, oh, by the way, this tocopherols actually, uh, existed in egg isoforms. If you may interested, you may uh, Google it up, okay? But today we're going to focus only on alpha and also from gamma uh, tocopherols. So alpha the tocopherols have been shown to uh, suppress the UEV induced edema, erythema, and repeat procedures, okay? And the good thing about it, it also uh, stimulate the uh, the G, uh, glutathione synthesis. Okay, so glutathione synthesis glutathione is another type of antioxidants that is quite powerful, like vitamin C. Okay, that means it can be used directly, and it can also be used in the enzymatic activities. So um, beside that. It also can downregulate MMP1, okay, metaloproteinase, as you can, uh, if you can still recall from my previous slide. So this, this is actually the enzyme that breaks down the uh, corrigens. So study has shown that alpha tocopherol is able to downregulate the MMP via the suppressive effects on MP1 DNA bindings, which means that it can stop the production MMP at the uh, expression level, gene expression level. Okay. Besides stopping the breaking downs, it also can stimulate the corrigent synthesis. So basically, do the exactly the opposite way of how it's done. Okay. So how does it increase the corrigent synthesis? It 
increase the collagenous gene transcription in aging fibroblasts without altering the level of its natural inhibitor. So what does it mean? It interferes okay, the collagen synthesis at genetic or the DNA level without interfering the protein levels. So that means it keeps on expressing the collagen uh, uh, to produce collagen, but it doesn't remove away the inhibitors for it. So the body will determine okay, when to stop the collagen synthesis. Okay, so it doesn't, um, uh, in a way, interfering the balance of the system in producing the collagen. So this is quite important because you, we don't want to overdo anything here, okay, when it comes to collagen. When you have too much of collagen, then you might have other, for example, kilo or other things that might happen, okay. And lastly, Percofiros also useful in suppressing the melanogenesis and MRI expressions of the tyrosinase and tyrosine related protein 2. So technically, these two enzymes are those that involve in the uh, production of the melanins. Okay. The third they will have here is the carotenoids. So carotenoids is um, if you can find in a lot of uh, different types of fruits or vegetables, okay, as long as they are orange or yellow in color, then you can find inside them. For example, from the pictures here, you may see you may get the natural sources from uh, pumpkin, carrots, uh, bell peppers, corns, uh, papaya, okay, etc. Okay, so as long as this, the color is orange, then you have a certain amount of carotene inside. Because carotene is basically like a uh, orange pigment uh, molecules. It gives the colors. Okay. So as long as orange, that means that carotene is there. Okay. So it produced by plants, algae, and some types of fungus and some bacteria. Um, we're not going to go through the whole families of them. Okay, we're going we will only be focusing on two uh, main types here. First is the beta carotene, second is the extra gentine. Okay. So um extra gentine has been proven to be able to decrease the oxidative stress, reduce the RX productions, and increase the antioxidant enzyme activity and decrease the membrane perturbations. Okay, so all this basically is to provide the um, the, the damage done by the UVA radiations. And interestingly, in the very recent study, it also showed that the uh, carotene can reduce the skin roughness, which is very important when it comes to the skin aging. Technically, when your the roughness is correlated um, positively with the, the aging of the skin. So when roughness increase, your skin wrinkles increase, okay? And carotenoids has been proven to be able to significantly reduce the skin roughness in the case here, okay? If you're interested, you may refer to the uh, journal 17 later on in my last slide um, for further read-up, okay? Now, we also have natural substance. Um, Coenzyme Q10, you might heard it, okay, before, mainly, um, it's a natural substance that you might find even producing in your own body, and we also use it to for some skin products. Okay, so why CoQ10 is important? It technically also targeting the MMP. It has suppressed the MMP production, okay, by reducing the expression, gene expression in keratinocytes. And with that, it means that it stops or reduces the breakdowns of collagen within the skin cells, okay? And secondly, it also can accelerate the production of basement membrane components, including the meramina 332 and type 4, type 6 uh, corrigions. Um, basically, this is very important because this, again, it increases the renewal of the cells layers on your skin. 
your skin looks good and there's no breakdown of the corrections, you'll be looking um, 10, 10 G. Okay. Second one will be your EGT or agrotyonins. Okay. EGT can suppress the UVB uh, radiations. Okay. And suppress the expression of MMP, one protein in fibroblast. So technically, it's the same thing, quite similar points and Q10s. They serve the same purpose, they can reduce the damage, and they also um, reduce the breakdowns of the corrigence. Last but not least is polyphenols. Polyphenols like carotenol actually also come in a lot of forms, okay? And we're not going to go through all of them because there's too much in their families. So uh, today we'll be going to talk about uh, EGCGs, the epigrocetin and Gerex and the Bristro. So uh, EGCG might not be familiar, okay? But this, uh, there's a clinical trial that has proven that oral administration of EGCG can significantly increase the minimal erythema dose to UV and prevent the destructions of the abdominal barrier function. So what does it mean by minimal erythema dose? Minimal erythema dose actually means that the dosage of UV that you need to trigger the sunburn effect on your skin. So by that means that the higher the better. Higher dose means that you need a lot more of UV exposure in order to trigger the sunburn effects on the skin. Okay? And furthermore, EGCG also has been shown to reduce the, uh, the expression again of MMP. That means it can stop the breakdowns of the corrections. Okay? The next and also one of the highlight points here in this lecture is reverse retro. So why is it important? Because reverse retro has been told, has been, has been believed that it has the, um, is playing an important role in human longevity. Okay, so as you can see here, the diagram here, this is the longevity pathway that we've been, stu been studying very extensively. Okay, this is a simple a uh, simple form, okay, short form, okay, it is much more complicated process, but in general, this is the pathway that the researcher or the scientist believe that this is the one that contribute to the longevity of human mankind. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go into details. This will be also part of our healthy aging lectures. Um, I only want you to focus on the voxel here and also the sertrin here. Okay, sertrin 1 and foxol. Okay, when sertrin 1 is being um, activated, he activated foxol. Foxol is a group of genes that stimulates the longevity genes. So longevity genes here basically means the genes that actually express the enzyme uh, enzymatic antioxidants. That means with the foxol being stimulated, more SOD will be produced, more ascorbic procedures will be produced, and so on and so forth. So with that means that um, it will reduce oxidative stress in the body as overall, and by that it improves the lifespan of humans. Okay? So, re um, like I mentioned, it has shown that it's important. This reverse retro has been shown to be able to accelerate or stimulate the foxol activations. And you know where to get it? From your red wine. Okay, so you may drink red wine. As you claimed before, it has some health effects. With the right amount of red wines, it actually helps to boost out the antioxidant activities to your body. Of course, if you're not a wine drinker, you may get it from natural source from berries, okay? Uh, blueberries, grapes, uh, raspberries, etc. All the berries actually contain a, a significant amount of reverse compared to other fruits, okay? All the berries, okay? 
In addition, this erythro also directly inhibits the tyrosinase activity, okay, which means that it can reduce the pigmentation process. Okay. Now, this brings to our conclusion today. It is almost inevitable that we're getting the, the damage from the exposure to UV. There's no way you can avoid that. Okay. Now, the question is how can we counter off that? And do we have uh, enough good treatments to actually counter off that? For sure, the study previous has shown that treatment with antioxidants is good enough. For sure, you provide certain extent of protective effects to the skin. But how do you actually deliver the antioxidant to your skin cells? That is the question to ponder. Okay, so with that, I end my lecture today. The capture screenshot here is the review journals. I will put the links below the post. If you guys are interested, then you may have a look at it. Okay, these are the references. Um, whatever you seen earlier, you can find out or you can have a more readout from the reference here. Before you guys go, let me just introduce a bit on the programs that I'm covering or I am teaching now in the, uh, in the Faculty of Medicine in UCSI UCSIVST. So this is actually one of the kind in Malaysia nowadays. If you were to um, venture into aesthetic fields, you will, if you wanted to be an aesthetic doctor in future, then this program might be the one you're looking for. So pay across attention for five minutes, I'll go through very fast. But this five minutes might be the five minutes that change the whole career pathway of your future. Okay. So Master of Science in Healthy Aging, Medical Aesthetic and Regen Medicine is the first program that combine these three fields or the future of the medicine fields together in one program. It is one of a kind in Malaysia and also one of a kind in the world. There's none of the programs that you can find anywhere in the, in the world that actually combine these three fields together. They might sound a bit um, different from each other, but in fact, they have their integrated part that you cannot separate from each other. Like how we explain the skin and how it links back to healthy aging earlier. So in fact, they are all three integrated modules. So this program has also been recognized by our Ministry of Education. Okay, we has been given the, um, the uh, uh, potential accreditations by our MQA, and it also be recognized by the MOH. Whatever we've been covering is enough for you to take the exam to get yourself the license of aesthetics. And most importantly, we are providing the profounding learning experience. You will be guided. If you join our program, you'll be guided by subject experts. Uh, 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 aesthetic doctors with years of experience, access to the latest aesthetic equipment, lasers, um, botox, fillers, ultrasounds, okay, uh, microdermabations, all this for free, okay, if you join our programs. If you were to take the course outside, it can easily charge you around 10,000, I would say. Okay. So we have a lot of students coming from all over from other countries okay up to now we have already around 200 okay by the time i'm telling you the lecture now we have reaching around 200 graduates okay 100 percent passing rates we never have any student that fails okay recovering healthy aging modules uh aesthetic modules and regen modules so um entry requirement we only need mbbs as long as you have an MBBS or MD degrees, then you are allowed to join us. Okay. Well, for international, it's the same things, but you might need your English uh, to be tested out if you are not from a university that using English as a teaching medium. And what I wanted to emphasize to you guys here is that this program is designed, parameter to all the working adults here in Malaysia. Why I'm saying so? Because 
This program is only conducted, the classes is only conducted once in a month and it will only be conducted over the weekend. So you don't have to worry that like giving up your jobs, you know, you have to travel you have to uh, KLs in order just to attend the classes, you have to quit your job for two years. No, you don't have to worry all any of that. Because technically, you need to take one day off in a month and you don't even need to take every month. Okay, you don't even need to physically uh, be here with us every month. And with the recent COVID pandemic outbreaks, our school or our faculty have decided to open up for online learning at least to the, towards the end of the semester, uh, end of the year 2020s. Which that means that if you're coming from Sabah, Sarawak or Penang, you don't even need to travel here. All this will be converted into online lecture, like what we've been, you are doing now. Okay, you only listen to the lectures. Then by the time of the exam, then you just take the exams. Okay, you don't need to be physically here. Okay, career prospect. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are from um, GP or specialist, but if you are uh, GPs, you should be earning around seven to ten thousands. If you take our programs after the graduations, you may get up to twelve thousands or fifteen thousands, and you might be able to start in working in aesthetic clinic but you might not be able to touch your patient yet okay but you might be assisting uh, in the aesthetic clinic then after you've gotten your license gotten your lcp license then you can earn more than fifteen thousand easily for sure and if you have your own aesthetic clinics then you may earn up to fifty thousand or more so in fact one of our lectures that teaching the aesthetic nowadays he, he is also one of the entrepreneurs that have his own uh, aesthetic clinics and he is himself also one of our alumni that graduate from our programs. So um, please contact us, okay? Um, grab your phone, okay? Scan the QR code. Um, whether you want to inquire us or you just want to follow up us on the updates or just want to follow up us on the future CME talks, just scan the code, okay, follow us on the Facebook and we're going to get in touch with you when there's a, a new activity or new event is coming in, okay? With that, I thank you for your attention. Um, it's nice giving talk to you guys. See you and take care.